Hello, and welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'd like to welcome any new listeners and give you the short snippet that in April, my family and I sold our house in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we are now in an RV living and going across the country. So just a quick update that we have had quite an adventure for the past four or five, five-ish days. So we are boondocking, which means that we're not connected to a source of power or water or sewer. So we don't have the comforts of the campground. We are on what's called BLM land, the Bureau of Land Management. And this is where like this kind of just government land and they let people camp on it. And we're in Moab, Utah. So you camp, there's no cost. And we were invited by another family we met. There's a organization called Full-Time Families. And we, we met them there and they were all meeting up in, in Moab, just kind of out of coincidence. So we're all spread out and there are 11 rigs here. And they have been tremendous to us as we weren't and we're still not up set up for this. <laughs> we are used to the luxury of a campground where we're plugged into electric and have our AC running and don't have to worry about conserving water. And I keep joking that it's kind of like a commune but not a weird one. It's one where everyone helps each other out. You know, someone's going into town, they're like, do you need anything? And our generator, we bought a generator, it wasn't working. So people came out and helped. And it's just an awesome group of people. But we are learning so much. I feel like my head's going to explode. So it reminds me of the days when we first got used to the rig, you know, three months ago. And this is just a whole new like experience for us. We're learning a ton. And we're going to aim to stay maybe three more days and then try to see a bit of Colorado before we head out east to go vote. So that is my update, but more importantly, on to today's guests, Madison Bezlicek and Vicki Roy. Now, Madison and Vicki were past Redesigning Wellness Academy participants. And just as I did last week, if you listened, I wanted to really discuss the COVID landscape and like kind of take a recap now that we're able to pause a little bit in 2020 and think about kind of what they have experienced and how they're looking into 2021. So we'll do one more episode next week for a business owner perspective, but just want to get different perspectives out there. If you don't already know, registration for 2021 Redesigning Wellness Academy is now open. If you're looking for community, guidance and mentoring and new ideas for well-being in 2021, Come and join us. You can go to my website and click on Redesigning Wellness Academy for more details. And as a podcast listener, you get $100 off by entering the code podcast at checkout. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Madison and Vicki. We'll start with Madison. As the health strategies practice leader at Highland, Madison supports the health strategies team through mentorship and professional growth and development, technical skills training, and well-being strategy execution to ensure Highland offers innovative and strategic solutions to clients. Madison also works with Highland clients to provide customized strategies based on each organization's unique population needs and business priorities through targeting the many dimensions of employee well-being. Madison earned her bachelor's in exercise physiology from the University of Wisconsin and a master's degree in health, physical activity, and chronic disease from the University of Pittsburgh. Now on to Vicki. Vicki Roy is a senior health strategist at Highland. As a health strategist, Vicki provides wellness leadership to Highland clients and assists with the development and execution of thoughtful health and wellness strategies. Vicki works to provide a solution customized specifically to each company and their employees' unique needs. Vicki earned a bachelor's degree from Georgia Southwestern State University. And I really wish that when I was back at the health plan, I could have worked at with consultants like Vicki and Madison. They're awesome. Now, in today's interview, we discuss Madison and Vicki's reaction to COVID, both personally and professionally, what went over well with clients and maybe not so well. We talk about what they put into action from RWA, Redesigning Wellness Academy, and how they are approaching wellness with their clients in 2021. They also, of course, leave us with a tangible tip. So if you're looking for a perspective from a consultant, a wellness consultant perspective, this is the episode for you. Now, before we dive into this episode, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Kind Kids. Kind Kids are volunteer projects in a box that come delivered to your doorstep with 100% of the materials needed to do a meaningful volunteer experience by yourself or with your family. With COVID canceling so many in-person volunteer experiences, this is the perfect way to continue to give back from home, and 100% of the proceeds go to benefit a mental health nonprofit called Project Helping. 
These are great for corporate volunteer experiences or at home volunteering with your family and friends. Head over to kindkit.com and the first 50 people to put in the code RW podcast can order a completely free kind kit to try out. So I'll link it all up in the show notes, but I definitely recommend you checking out kind kit. Now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy my interview with Madison Bezlicek and Vicki Roy. As always, thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, Corporate Wellness Consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Madison and Vicki, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so very glad to have you on right now. Thank you, Jen. This is Madison. We're excited to be here. Thanks for having me and Vicki. It's such an honor. Well, you know, it was so funny. I was just thinking, I've both I've given you both separate shout outs before. So you've had your name dropped on the Redesigning Wellness Podcast before, which is pretty cool. That's true. <laughs> now, and you, uh, you'll you be able to, to distinguish the voice the voices listeners. You've got Vicki. You'll be able to tell she's a fellow Southerner, and you'll be able to tell her accent from Madison's. Don't worry. Let's talk about when COVID first hit, which feels like a lifetime ago. So back in March, and I want you just to say from a personal perspective, and Vicki, we're going to start with you. What was your personal reaction to COVID? And then we'll talk about maybe kind of what did the impact look like in your role at Highland? Well, Jen, interestingly enough, I had just returned from Denver where I had attended Oprah's 2020 Vision Tour the weekend before, and they started canceling events here in Jacksonville. The first major event that was canceled was the Players Tournament, and I was at an a client's on-site health fair when the news was announced. And I, along with everybody that was at the event, was really shocked. Mm -hmm. You know, and looking back, I don't think we really understood how long this would last and how drastically it would impact our lives. Like all employers, our clients were scrambling to make decisions about remote work, for those who were able to, and for those who could not, how to keep their employees safe. And wellness in the traditional sense was put on the back burner. And my role changed from planning strategic wellness initiatives to really helping our clients explore testing options and how to secure personal protective equipment. That's quite a quite of a, a shift from what you're used to working on. But yeah, when wait, I asked this earlier, I had another interview this morning. And did you notice like with your clients, was there any pause when everything was going, oh crap, everything's closing. <laughs> get get out of the office, get out of the office. Um, did you have any pause before the storm hit of, you know, employers inquiring and needing your assistance? Or did it just never stop? It really never stopped. Yeah, our clients were really scrambling and we were trying to help them figure it out in the process of figuring it out ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. What a place to be in. And we'll need to talk offline about this Oprah 2020 vision because it sounds amazing. So we'll, we'll talk about that offline. Now, Madison, what about for you? Yeah, it was a shock. I don't remember exactly, you know, where I was. I don't remember a specific moment, but I didn't take it very seriously because I didn't bring any of my stuff from the office home. A lot of it's still there and I haven't been back in six months, but it was quite a shock because all of a sudden we can go back in the office and I found myself at home with my husband working from home and we have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and at the time a four-month-year-old baby. So it was quite a shock to be working from home with three kids in a really small house tough moments, definitely, but also really sweet moments too, that I actually will always cherish. So it's better now because they're in school. But yeah, it was, it was interesting for sure. 
<laughs> yes, we we have talked about just being a parent during these times. I can't even imagine, first of all, having an extra kid. So I have two, you have three, and then having, what do you say, a four month old at the time was mm-hmm. Grace four, four months old. Yep. Yeah. I, I just can't even imagine. So did you notice the same with clients? Was it kind of the same reaction that, that Vicki experienced as well? Exactly. Yes. Very similar. And I'll also add, we kind of immediately identified that there was a need for mental health at the time to really help people, you know, recognize that this was an opportunity to really think about their mindset, think about how it's in impacting employees' mental well-being. And specifically, too, we narrowed in on helping leaders and managers understand the role that they had at the time to support their employees and their mental health. So we kind of immediately shifted there. And I think that's still even a need today. Yes, absolutely. Now, what were some resources that you offered? I want to go on both sides. Something that went really well, this maybe and this can be any time from when COVID hit officially, you know, the March timeframe, you know, to now, something that went over really well with your clients and maybe something that may have been a miss. Like, you know, you thought it was going to go well, but maybe it didn't. And uh, Madison, while you're talking, you just go ahead and answer that one first. Yeah. And I just want to add to, I'm speaking on behalf of our entire health strategies practice. I'm sort of representing them today. They are the real deal working, you know, with more of our clients on the, on the front lines with this, but I will share that we, another, a resource that we have thought about and implemented lately is the shift to SDOH or social determinants of health. And I think COVID has really expedited that because if you're unfamiliar with the social determinants of health, it's the conditions in which people are born, live, and work, et cetera. And I really think about these as the root cause of one's unwellness, you know, the barriers that get in the way, socioeconomic status, education, environment, social support, things like that. So in the midst of, you know, kind of what's going on, we have kind of taken a step back and thought about, you know, what are the real barriers to well-being specifically right now? And mental health is one of those, like we've already talked about, but we've focused on, we're starting to focus, I should say, on, you know, evaluating that within the employer's influence. What does the employer have the ability to influence in social determinants of health. And I just think that, like I said, COVID has expedited this. They're more open to looking at it from the employer realm and they're more open to supporting employees in this way. So what have you found, Madison? And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I just want to expand this conversation because social determinants of health is just a really hard thing for people to tackle because employers do feel like, well, what am I going to do about that, right? And it is such an underlying cause of, of so much of what we talk about in well-being. So have you found any lever? I don't even think that's the right word. I'm formulating my question as I'm thinking. Have you found anything that employers are willing to address, tackle, support around social determinants of health? What we have found so far, and we're just kind of dipping our toe in the water to be transparent, because I think that there is a lot of work to do in this space. We're starting to talk about it more in terms of financial well-being, you know, identifying that as a barrier to health and helping, you know, build either financial well-being programs or how do we just help people out in that way and in the mental health realm. So, you know, do we have services that are covered for mental health and what what access do they have? So those are the kind of the two areas I would say are maybe lower hanging fruit that employers are more open to because there are going to be things, you know, they just don't have influence over. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of looking at, especially, you know, we work for an employee benefits firm. So, you know, what, what is maybe tied to the health plan, access to healthcare and preventive care and other things like that. So we're really trying to figure out what's most palatable for employers. And we're, we're finding that that's kind of the best place to start. 
Mm-hmm. Well, good for you for continuing that initiative and not letting it drop because of COVID. And as you said, it's accelerated it. I'm going to pause there and get to Vicki and then I'm going to come back to maybe something that didn't work so well. Um, Vicki, anything that you have, your team has offered that went over well? Yeah, so to Madison's point, several different surveys have reported that rates of anxiety and depression have really risen with COVID. Alcohol sales, anxiety and depression prescriptions, and domestic abuse have all spiked in the past few months. So it's really no surprise to us that things that have really gone over well have been related to anxiety, stress, and mental health. So Highland has hosted two webinars with experts in the field that addressed stress and anxiety and really gave our clients some practical ways to help their employees. Madison and I created a 10-minute talk on a shift to mental well-being that we distributed to our clients, again, with really granular ways and ideas to help their employees. And then I have created short custom videos for several clients that outline available resources, including their own EAP carrier resources, national, local resources that clients have shown in virtual staff meetings and or posted on their internal intranet or company website for employees to access on demand. That's awesome. I'm always impressed by both of you and the the information that you put out there for your clients, as well as even just on LinkedIn. So I think you're on the forefront of creating valuable resources. Now, at least for me, I know that there's been a few things that was kind of like I thought would be exciting for, for employees and it was kind of like crickets. Did you do anything or try anything that maybe didn't get the traction that you thought? Madison, I guess back to you. Well, I would say something that we struggled with at least was communication. You know, we had like these great flyers. We had you know information about stress and anxiety, like Vicki mentioned, but we didn't have a way to get them to employees in some instances because they were furloughed, um, some of our manufacturing clients. So that was kind of identified as this is a barrier. We we can't communicate with them at this time. So that was a real struggle for us to, you know, be able to help our clients get to employees in that way because we didn't have a good way to communicate with them. Yeah, that is really tough, especially when they are furloughed. Now, Vicki, what about you? Yeah, so early on, some of the wellness programs that are traditionally utilized um, by our clients, they just didn't go over well. No surprise that many of my clients um, canceled their on-site events, screening, health fairs, lunch and learns, and they really had to think about ways to restructure their program um, if those were important components. So that, you know, anything on-site just really didn't go over very well as a whole for this year. Yeah, and imagine that's not changing, right? I mean, they're continuing. I guess this is a question to both of you. I'm assuming all your clients are doing virtual uh, interactions when it comes to well-being. Is that accurate or are some people doing in-person? I would say it's accurate for the most part, but we do have, like I said, manufacturing clients and some people that are kind of back to business as usual. They're just taking you know, the necessary precautions and following the guidelines accordingly. And so there are still some clients moving forward with on-site screenings and flu shots and, and still you know, looking for some of that. But the majority, we've definitely had to pivot and offer things like virtual um, lunch and learns and health fairs and, and just figure out how to be more engaging and connect in this virtual environment. Yes, definitely. Well, thanks for your honesty. I know no one wants to talk about the things that didn't go well, but we all have them, right? We're all all trying our best. Now, although Redesigning Wellness Academy, God, we just ended in July, but it feels like it was a lifetime ago. And when we were all together, we talked about so many areas of well-being. And so talk to me about what are some maybe 
ideas you picked up, some facts, or maybe some thoughts um, that you implemented with your clients or with yourself? And either either one of you can start. Don't jump, don't all jump at once. I should just call on you, <laughs> Vicky. Vicky, go. <laughs> Well, personally and professionally, I really enjoyed the session with Mary Abijay that outlined how to manage up. In that session, we learned that managing up is consciously working with higher ups to obtain the best possible results for you, your boss, and ultimately your organization. So I actually have the privilege of working with two bosses, Madison, who says that she's not my boss, but really she is, and then the president of Highland Jacksonville. So really understanding their work style, preferences, priorities, and pet peeves have helped me understand how to work better with them. And Mary also reminded us that we need to understand our own preferences, strengths, and weaknesses so that we can and assess the gap and choose where to adapt. And although the session was really aimed at working better with your boss, it was also very helpful in developing strategies for me to better work with my clients. Yes, Mary is one of my favorites. And she was actually a favorite from Academy members. And this is a spoiler a spoiler alert that I'm bringing her back for 2021 because she's just so good. <laughs> so I'm glad that resonated. And I'm glad at least one of your bosses is Madison. So at least you've got <laughs> one win. But <laughs> Madison, Madison, what about you, boss lady? That is so funny that she thinks I'm her boss. That's funny. <laughs> we'll go with it, right? <laughs> yeah, think of myself more as a mentor. Um, so I took so many things away from the academy. It was hard to, to boil it down. But what I would share, one of the most important things I took from the training and started to implement in our own organization for our internal strategy at Highland was the importance of building relationships across the organization. Jen, you helped us understand how this is so important. And like many companies, we've too struggled to be transparent with having well-being initiatives siloed in the past and not always aligned with other HR or organizational initiatives. So I really was motivated and encouraged by the training to reach out and just learn and listen and ask what other departments were working on. And an example was our talent management department to learn about what they had going on and how that might align with what, you know, we're doing with our well-being strategy and how we can collaborate in the future. And so this really helped strengthen my relationships within our HR team. And it's been really fun to see our conversations evolve, even in just the last few weeks as we're planning for 2021. And I also worked on strengthening my relationships within our HR team, and it's been really fun just to see our conversations evolve, even over the last few weeks, and they've come up with some awesome ideas, and I think it really uh, stemmed from just building that relationship and seeing that we had more common goals than we realized. Oh, that warms my heart because it is so easy. And you all know this is so easy in our in our roles and well-being to get very siloed and just think, especially with COVID too, that everyone's really busy and they don't need to, you know, hit one more email and that can really get in our head sometimes. And, you know, now in our new virtual world, it's even more important to collaborate and connect. So I'm glad that you both got something from that you're putting into practice. Yeah, that makes me makes me happy. <laughs> Madison, you just mentioned a strategy in 2021. So one of the things we talked about in Redesigning Wellness Academy was like, you can only plan so far, right? Kind of keep it loose, but still plan. So what are you doing (laughs) for 2021? Do you have kind of how are you approaching planning? And and you can talk about both within the the organization of Highland and with your clients. And uh, Madison, you just want to keep going? Yeah, sure. So at Highland, we do work to build custom strategies. So it really depends on the client, but things that we're talking about for 2021, just a continued focus on mental and emotional well-being. We're actually talking more about standalone EAPs or other mental health resources that sort of layer upon a current EAP 
also things like uh, resilience trainings, kind of like you, you know, you do, Jen, things like that. We're also looking at ways to help address burnout and anxiety, and even just things like encouraging employees to use their PTO. You know, that is a big one. People aren't using their PTO. They need a, a mental health day, either on their own or surprise them with a mental health day. You know, take the the day off or leave early communicating resources that they already have and or really focusing in on on self-care. So this is something that's big is mental health. And I think a part of that too is reducing the stigma. We're actually gearing up for Mental Illness Awareness Week in October. And part of that is just helping our clients and even internally um, address the stigma with mental health. So that is one of them. And the other one kind of goes along with that, it that I wanted to share. And it's this concept of designing work for well-being. It's a a term that I saw from Jen Fisher, the chief well-being office officer out of Deloitte. I I know that that you know of her, Jen, and she really kind of has us thinking about this concept of defining the structure of one's job so that it can align with supporting the employee's well-being. And I think COVID is just going to expedite this concept. And that means, you know, giving employees flexibility in their schedule, more autonomy in their job, using technology more for connection, remote work to address issues like anxiety and burnout. So I think that's something too, this is more for those progressive companies that are ready for it, but really thinking about designing work for well-being is something that's on our radar as well. Yeah, I love that. And uh, just as a little aside, I Jen and I had an interview scheduled, right? And then COVID hit. <laughs> so <laughs> I've got to go get her back on the podcast. I love that, designing work for well-being. And so I want to dig into that just a little bit because you said the more progressive employers. Because one of the things that I've been finding is that there's that trust issue out there, right? Now that people are working mm. from home, it's almost become like, what are they doing? Or people are checking up on them or they're just assuming they're not working, right? So if we're going to design work for well-being then they have to have that trust built in. And some organizations just kind of go back to that skeptical mindset of if an employee is not going to work if you don't you know, stand over them and watch them. So, and this may be too early. This may just be in concept. So feel free to push back. But how, do you have any clients that you think would be interested in it and or are interested in it designing work for well-being? I mean, it is, it is very early. We're still thinking about this concept. So I don't, you know, I don't have a lot to share yet, but I think that even just thinking about our company as an example, you know, before you, you didn't know if, if, if that trust factor was necessarily there. Cause I mean, unless you had a, you know, a big remote working population or a strong policy around that, you just didn't know if it would work or not. And now you know, a lot of companies know, you know, that it works. So um, I think we're going to have just open conversations to it. But, you know, to be honest, I don't know what it looks like. We're going to start, you know, just opening the conversation. But like I said, it, it kind of has to be, it has to be the right fit for an employer that's ready to have mm-hmm. that conversation. But more and more research, you know, is out there when, when, employees have that, there is more engagement, you know, job productivity can be increased. So it's definitely something that is on the horizon, but we, you know, we don't have that built out yet. (laughs) Yeah. So thank you for that. And I look forward to hearing some results as you kind of start talking and having that conversation with people because it just, it is one of my pet peeves, I guess, because I'm an entrepreneur, but even when I was in corporate world, I had a lot of freedom. I've always gone to freedom and autonomy and roles. So, and I'm always going to get my work done. There's just no question. (laughs) You can't can't work for yourself and not get your work done. So it's uh, preposterous to me, like when organizations just don't try their employees. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. Now, what about you, Vicki? What, what's going on with your clients in 2021? How are you kind of strategizing with them? Uh, does it look different? Like, are you going more short-term versus long-term? What's well, going on? I think that you will have to be flexible and you could have to pivot again in 2021 for sure. But what I see is a renewed focus on financial well-being programs. We know that even before COVID, 
companies were aware of the financial stress that many Americans struggle with every day. And with 2021, 2020 came furloughs, layoffs, reductions in salaries. So I definitely think that in 2021, there will be a renewed focus on financial well-being programs. Another thing that I think will happen, and we mentioned this earlier in the podcast, but just a continued move away from those traditional on-site events to virtual events, maybe in lieu of an on-site screening event, considering some of my clients are considering preventive care campaigns where they're encouraging their employees to go to their physician and get that yearly checkup. And of course, this all depends on what happens with COVID, how comfortable employees are um, in doing that. But there are some statistics that are starting to come out that employees are delaying care. So I think that that could be a focus in 2021. And then a concept that I'm really excited about is a virtual health fair. Um, That's a new concept to a lot of my clients that typically host those on-site events. But for me, the thing that makes me excited about it is my clients have the opportunity to incorporate some fresh ideas and fresh vendors into this virtual concept. So desk ergonomic instruction for employers who have remote workers, virtual massage where they bring in a massage therapist to show um, their employees how to do maybe desk stretches or massage themselves, Um, yoga instruction, cooking classes and demonstrations and learning and teaching how to do um, mindfulness is some concepts that can be incorporated in that virtual health fair. Yes, remind me that I need to send you something. I just stumbled upon about a virtual health fair. So that's an aside. Well, well, don't let me forget that. And I think that's such a good point, Vicki, that it's, it's COVID has created a need for creativity, new ideas. You can't do the same old, same old anymore because you have no choice. You have to do new things. Let me dig into the financial wellness piece a little bit. Do you think out of your employers who have furloughed, laid off, reduced hours, are they comfortable talking about financial wellness? Because in essence, the employee could ultimately look to them to be like, you cut my hours. <laughs> You're talking to me about financial wellness. Do you anticipate that those employers would still be comfortable enough to to tackle financial wellness? And I know it's kind of a weird question. It's just one thing that kind of popped up in my head as you were talking about it. Yeah. So Jen, I'm never afraid to have the conversation with my clients. It's my opinion that that my job is to recommend programs to them that might be a good fit. Certainly, they do get the everyday feedback from their employees. And for employers who have had a lot of negative feedback, it might not be a good strategy for now. It might be something that they really focus on maybe later on in 2021. I'd like to think that most of, you know, the employees would understand that the company, you know, sometimes has to do what they have to do, but I could also understand the anger over the company having to do it. So I think that it is one of those program components that really you need to have the conversation, but understand that it might not be a good fit for everybody. Yes. And I like the fact that you just bring it, bring it up and see it kind of test the waters a little bit. And, and truly, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just a business decision. Like, would you rather be furloughed and, or, or not have a job completely, right? Or reduce your hours. I've had a friend who's a lawyer and she had her um, hours reduced. And so she's like, well, better that than being completely laid off. So she's got a good approach with it, but you just never know. Sometimes people don't get it. And if the company doesn't really communicate that and say, we have to do this. Otherwise, we're going to be really in trouble. So uh, thanks for answering that totally random question. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Now, if you had to boil down your wisdom, 
you know, really COVID error wisdom into one tangible tip for wellness practitioners to take away from our conversation and kind of what we've talked about today, what would that be? And uh, Vicki, we'll start with you. Be flexible. Be ready to pivot. (laughs) I wish we had that crystal ball so that we would know what 2021 is going to look like. But unfortunately, we just don't. So be flexible. Be creative. Love it. Exclamation, exclamation. That is, yes, perfect. Perfect advice. What about you, Madison? Yeah, what I would share right now is that I think it's really important to understand in this time what employees really need and what they really value, not just what you may think as, you know, a leader, what you've heard other companies doing. And, you know, to be tangible, I think that this can be done by a smaller focus group or maybe asking managers, you know, what they're hearing, what are people needing? And even if it's a survey, you know, that can be done in the right way. As an example, I know many in companies are doing surveys right now about return to work and response to COVID. We actually just did a survey like this for our employees. And if you ask the right questions, it can really help you understand what employees are struggling with right now and how you may need to, to shift your strategy. So I would say just make sure you're not assuming and most importantly, listening and asking what your employees need right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm going to ask this of you. Thank you for that, Madison. So if, if you had to think about your clients, the ones that you work with, what percent would you say are back to work or ne- maybe never left work? And what percent would you say are kind of st- like still virtual? And I, I didn't prep you for this. So it is totally ballpark. Um, either one of you can answer. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say probably... Uh, 60, 40, I would say, you know, maybe 30 to 40% are back and 60% are still totally remote. Yeah. And are you, are you seeing that, that they are making plans to go back to work or you think, are they mainly going in, it may be a lot longer? I think a lot are, I think many are making plans. You know, we've heard, especially in our industry, you know, there's certain companies that are saying nothing until January 1st, we're going to be off. Don't even, you know, plan for it until January when we'll reassess. Um, So some are are in that boat and others are, you know, trying to assess to see when we can come back to the office and weigh, you know, the safety component to the, you know, collaborative and productivity component. So it really just depends. We've seen just tons of different variables and you know every company kind of has their own situation so it's been very interesting how you know the the approaches are very different yes absolutely vicky is it about the same on your end in jacksonville yeah it is it's interesting because you know i i do have the privilege of working with a healthcare system obviously um they're essential and I do have some other companies that are considered essential that are in the transportation business, as well as um, a couple of schools that have recently obviously gone back to brick and mortar. So I would say it's probably 60% remote and 40% still, you know, working and, and in the office or at the company uh, working on site. So yes, I do have, you know, quite a few that are still working. And so to Madison's point, you know, it, it makes it interesting. And again, I can't assume because if you're working remotely, that might be one strategy, but if you have employees at your organization, then that that's a whole nother, you know, strategy in and of itself. Like our jobs aren't hard enough, right, Vicki? <laughs> it's just, it is, is really hard. It, it, it's, it's challenging to, to really just think about the different models and how each employer is different. And especially with healthcare, what they've been through, what they're going to continue to go through. And then, you know, like you said, transportation. Just, it's, I think that is one of the most, the biggest challenges as well, well-being in our roles is that when you go across different industries, it can, can be completely different and how you need to and should engage employees. So I'm going to throw you for a loop and ask you a question that I did not prepare you for. 
And so we can, you can have your time to think about it. But what do you think is one skill that you have strengthened or maybe leaned into during COVID? So maybe it's a skill or a strength that you have that you have really just, I guess, I guess the best way to say is leaned into as a result of COVID. Take your time too. That's good. (laughs) I can go first. I guess what comes to mind for me is empathy. Uh, I know empathy is something that I've learned a lot about lately. And I've had what I know Brave Brown calls empathy misses where you're trying to be empathetic, but instead sometimes you, you are not helpful. But that's something I've been leaning into is, you know, how do I how do I lean into empathy? Meaning, you know, I may not be going through what you're exactly going through now, but I can relate to the emotions underneath that. And I can still, you know, sit with you in this hardship and not judge you and um, just kind of offer support in that way. So empathy is one that I would say I've definitely been leaning on right now. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. We could all use more of that. So I'm glad that's gotten stronger for you. Now, Vicki, what about you? So I've seen a lot of quotes recently about COVID, but my favorite is, may the new normal teach us to be grateful for the things the old normal taught us to take for granted. Mm-hmm. So I have tried to be grateful in the midst of of what has been the greatest and most dramatic change in my life. I think that being grateful for the things that we have it is really a good life skill. And I've really tried to work on it, even on the days when it's been most difficult. Mm-hmm. And Vicki, one of the things that I just love about you is I remember us being in RWA and we were all there and we were talking. I think it was one of the sessions. Do you remember we got all got together when COVID first hit and it was just like a yes. what the what the hell session, right? Let's just all get together. And I remember you saying something and you were like, we just need to give ourselves and each other grace. And I thought, I was like, this is just what I needed to hear right now. And it was perfect. So I just want to thank you for bringing that, both of you, bringing both of your positive energies to Redesigning Wellness Academy. It was a pleasure. So how can people get in contact with you all? It can just be your LinkedIn profile that I can link up for you or um, and anything you want to share here for contact info. Yep. LinkedIn is is perfect. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Yep. That's the best way to get hold of me as well, Jen. And just a shout out for Jen Arnold. Really enjoyed the Redesigning Wellness Academy. I would encourage anyone who wants to learn more and grow and develop their skills to consider joining your next next session. Oh, you can't see me, but I'm smiling. I've got a big smile on my face. Thank you so much, Vicki. Before we end today, is there anything that you want to leave my listeners with that I may not have asked or that you just want to say? And you can say, nope, I'm good, but I just want to provide some space here before we end. I'm good. (laughs) You're like, I just said it, Jen. I'm done. (laughs) What about you, Madison? Anything? Yeah, I guess I would just say that a reminder for wellness practitioners, whatever we want to call ourselves, well-being consultants out there that... I really think this is a journey and that persistence and patience is key, especially in, you know, a time like this when there's, there's such a need for well-being, but there's a focus on, you know, so many other operational initiatives. And when I first started in this career, I wanted to help everybody and do population health management. And I kind of had, you know, some binary thinking that I just needed, you know, there are unhealthy people and healthy people, and we just needed to help help everybody and change behaviors. But I've learned that it's really about helping people and supporting them in where they're at. And that may come one employee at a time and one point of connection at a time. And it it may even just be your coworkers and, you know, supporting them and showing up for them. And that may be one of the most powerful things you do too. So I just wanted to share that. That's kind of what I've learned so far 
in my career is that, you know, it's not just about trying to change populations of people, but really just, you know, how do I help the person that's in front of me and just keep, you know, that, that one employee in mind. Fantastic. That is lovely. I think we've all been there. Like I definitely, you've heard my story that I've been there, very binary thinker, black or white, healthy or unhealthy. So I appreciate that you talked about that because I've I've been there and understand that. One last thing is that I've also enjoyed getting to know baby Grace. That was the fun part. And I think that was a plus of COVID that people could show up with their children or, you know, another person had a grandchild on the call. And I love that because you got to see more than just, you know, a wellness practitioner, practitioner or an employee, you got to see a little bit more of them and got to see their family. So I loved seeing baby Grace in the in our calls. Well, <laughs> was thank you for welcoming her with open arms. It was, I agree. It was just nice to see another side of people. And I think it, it made it, it's made us all just more human to, you know, see each other's kids and our homes. And I think that's definitely, you know, a silver lining of COVID. Absolutely. Well, ladies, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Jen. There's been a lot of news and media attention lately about stress and job burnout. If you're trying to solve this problem with stress balls and those lovely stress dots that you get at health fairs that, you know, react with your skin and change colors, it's time to try a different approach. Redesigning Wellness offers an impactful resilience training that teaches employees how to thrive in the fast-paced, continuously changing environment that is corporate America. We take a multi-dimensional approach that not only includes the physical, but also emotional, mental, and spiritual dimensions. I love giving this training and the feedback has been tremendous. For more information on resilience training, visit redesigningwellness.com.